everybody, welcome to another episode of Stock Talk where we talk about all things investing. My name is Amon Reina and I'm an investment coach and founder of Sage Investors. And what I do as an investment coach is I help new investors and experienced investors who want to become financially secure but they feel confused, they feel intimidated and they feel just generally uninformed by the whole investing concept. Um, a lot of times people that I work with, they just don't know where to start when it comes to investing or they just feel like they've been investing but just aren't making any progress with, with their investments. So what I do as an investment coach is I teach people, I engage with people and show them how they can make more educated investment decisions so that they can achieve some level of financial freedom in their lives and achieve it with, with, with confidence. That's what I do as an investment coach. So this is Stock Talk. This is my little video slash podcast that I've uh, got going here where I like to talk about various things I'm seeing, observations I'm seeing uh, in the stock market, um, sharing with you some of my own uh, takes on them, and also sharing my own behaviors and decisions that I'm making, um, that I'm practicing in real time with you so that hopefully you can maybe take some nuggets of the thought process that I go through in making investment decisions and kind of bring it back to what you're doing and hopefully it may at some level may help help you out. So this is episode 76 and today I want to talk about uh, something that's quite common in the whole personal finance uh, realm and I, I I can't think of a better way to describe it as personal finance porn. Now if you're a regular listen to my podcast uh, a while ago I did a, a book report on this book written by Jonathan Chevro and Michael Drack called uh, Victory Lap, which talks about uh, a strategy and a process um, for transitioning uh, into retirement. And get, it's a great book and gets you into some of the thought process in, in that whole transition. It's actually one of the more popular podcasts that I've uh, put out there. And because there's a lot of people interested in, in understanding and you know want to take control of their financial destiny and want to make sure that they have some element of security and independence later in their life. So, Victory Lap is one aspect of how you can get to retirement and transitioning and, and enjoying a fulfilling retirement. There's also what we're seeing out there is the opposite of it. We're seeing a lot more uh, interest in not necessarily retiring in your 50s and 60s, but retiring in your 30s. And there's this whole kind of movement out there um, called FIRE, which is called Financially Independent Retire Early. And there's a lot of... Um, people out there uh, who have achieved that level and have uh, through various actions that they've taken in their life have achieved a situation where they are financially able to retire uh, or have achieved a certain level of financial independence that have allowed them to retire early and there's all kinds of you know you pick up your uh, pick up any you know business news newspaper look at the business section there's always going to be columns there's blogs bloggers out there who are actually blogging the experience of trying to become more financially independent in an earlier stage of life and uh, it's, it's becoming a big movement and we're seeing things like that but we're also seeing other kinds of what I call extreme personal finance. We're seeing you're seeing a lot of uh, discussions out there with respect to people paying their mortgage in three years uh, you know who have just uh, you know, bought a house and be able to pay off like three hundred thousand uh, dollars, three hundred thousand dollar mortgage in like three years. And, and there's people out there who have gone on uh, total spending like fasts, uh, like zero spending for like two years, and are blogging about that experience. There's people talking. You see here all kinds of uh, posts about uh, things you should be doing. Uh, you know, financial milestones you need you, you need to achieve. In your mid twenties, uh, there's all kinds of these uh, what I call extreme personal finance um, viewpoints, articles, content out there, and it's out there because people it's it's great, it's sexy because and it it captures a lot of uh, it's kind of like a shock and awe kind of thing, um, where people just see oh wait a minute this person like paid off their mortgage in three years oh boom I gotta click on this I gotta find out what they did. Oh my God, this person retired when they're like 28. Oh my God, and they didn't do anything. They just like lived a regular life and they just retired. Wow, I gotta find out what that. So what I find is these elements of extreme personal finance are extremely good copy and get a lot of clicks. And the business media really eats this stuff up because we all kind of eat this stuff up. We're all kind of interested in this. It's like mind candy. And to me, I, I to me, it's, it's personal finance porn. Um, so what do I think about this? Now, 
to me, what I, when these type of you know instances or examples uh, of content out there of people that are living their lives like that, to me in a way sends not exactly the most positive message. It's and to me it's it's almost a kind of attack on people's self esteem. Because when people read these type of posts and read these type of articles, the first thing they think about is, wait a minute, why am I not doing this? And oh my God, these people are all these people are like paying their mortgages in three years. I need to do something. Oh my God, this person is like retired now and like 33. Oh my, like I'm th like, what have I been doing with my life? And it, to me, it it sparks feelings of, of inadequacy. It sparks self esteem issues. And a lot of times, when we see that and we have to emotionally react to that. We got to do something, and it creates kind of it's, it becomes almost like a dieting kind of thing, and a body image thing. Like we know the great criticisms we have is we see things in the media uh, promoting or holding us to a level of how we should look, how we should dress, um, whether we should have six pack abs, um, the size of our breasts. You know the whole concept, and it creates uh, people feeling inadequate, feeling uh, having a self esteem issue. A lot of times what I'm seeing with a lot of these kind of personal finance stories and case studies of how people have achieved certain uh, personal uh, um, mile, financial milestones in a very extreme kind of way, um, to me is no different from people, uh, general media, putting out images like uh, with body image and holding us to social standards for that. Um, because... You know, so, so people feel like, you know, I have a bad body image, I don't feel good about myself. Well, I don't feel good about my personal. It's like I'm having a bad personal finance image. So to me, what that does is it creates emotional reactions. People start saying, okay, I got to do start doing stuffing and start doing things that may not be really compatible with their lifestyle, compatible with their, with their, with their value system, which is more important and may start engaging in kind of behaviors and trying to do things in, in, with, their, with their finances, with their savings, which just may not be cool with them. It may just not be truly be reflective of them. And uh, what I find really interesting though is when I read some of these uh, posts, there's, they go through the, you know, the process of how they've gone about you know, achieving the, 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 these milestones. But what I find really interesting and I scratch my head is, there seems to be a common thing, fee, uh, common theme with all these different examples of extreme personal finance, and that is uh, it kind of overlooks, and the people that are doing this ha have been able to sidestep a really important, what I you know I'll say cost center that really separates their ability to achieve these milestones from trugging along, like like the rest of us I guess, and that is it's one word kids. Kids, children. When I look at a lot of these cases, uh, people who are you know retiring early, paying their mortgage off early, uh, you know, adopted a spending moratorium for long periods of time. A lot of times, these people are single, um, or they're married, and they're with a couple. It's a couple that's doing it. But there's kids. Kids are not in the equation. So it, just doing basic math, like for example, if you're saving for retirement. Kids, you know, over a generate a lifetime, with raising a kid costs what's the number now? Two fifty. That's the going number. Two hundred fifty thousand to raise a kid, from birth to school, university. Well, that's two hundred fifty thousand is a hell of a lot of money. If that's a cost center you can avoid, and you want to adopt some of these extreme, uh, try to achieve some of these milestones in a very fast and efficient manner. Yeah, kids, not having kids is probably going to get you there a heck of a lot faster. And I, I, I swear, like, I don't think I've read too many um, examples or case studies or people who have been able to achieve some of these extreme personal finance milestones with kids. Um, like, what are you going to do? Like, if you're going to go on a, on a spending, like, moratorium, are you going to deprive your kids of, like, playing with toys? Are you going to just eat ramen noodles for, for, like, 20 years? Like, I don't think, I just, I haven't seen it. The closest person I see, it was the person I think, as far as I consider, was a pioneer of this extreme investing or extreme personal finance kind of uh, mentality, which was Derek Foster, uh, a gentleman who had, I believe, a few kids and raised a family and was able to retire. You know, he, and he wrote some books about it and became a big, big media guy. Uh, had a lot of buzz. Don't hear a lot about him now because apparently it's come out that over over time. Um, you know, one of the things was he he grew his portfolio by just you know reinvesting his dividends. Um, and was able to grow it to a point where he could just live off the dividends. And that was a big deal 
um, by a lot of people. But then it came out uh, a little while after that. The reason he got his portfolio to that level is he made a couple of really um, all in kind of bets on a few stocks that pit that hit and they paid off and he was able to grow his portfolio at an immense period and was able to achieve that life and he still is and you know what that's that's great that's what we can do it you know, obviously got to be authentic about it be upfront with it but as far as i know and he's got he had a family i don't know too many other cases and if somebody else out there is doing this and they've got a family and are achieving these levels or are very close to achieving their these personal financial milestones at a very fast rate Please share. I'd love to hear because I, I would love to give credit. I would give full props and full cre credence and full credibility to whoever can, can do that. I'm just seeing these examples and I go, I don't see, like, they don't have kids. And as someone in myself right now, I got two little boys and I know that there are constraints, you know, that I would love to do, that I would love to achieve, but I can't achieve them with two kids and I got to put them, you know, I got to put them in daycare and I got to put them, you know, in school kind of thing. And there's the daily activities, camps, all that stuff. It's hard. It's hard to be extreme personal finance person and carry that, um, carry that kind of financial commitment, financial responsibility, financial accountability to do that. And so, so what worries me is I see a lot of these examples are kind of put on a pedestal, like these are the standards you need to espouse to, you need to adopt these kinds of uh, extreme kind of savings habits, investing habits, um, debt management habits to achieve your financial goals. And for most of us, it's really hard to do that because just given the certain state of our lives. And so I just want to say, really what I want to talk about here is just when you're seeing these articles, when you're seeing these examples and these people you know, out there blogging about it, writing books about it, selling books about it. You got to take this stuff with a grain of salt because what they did does not mean it's going to work for you or me or anybody else. It worked for them because they made some conscious decisions uh, in how they wanted to live their life. And by all means, that is not the standard. And that, that does not mean you need to live your life like this to achieve your financial goals whether it be investing, you know, a lot of people, as I talk about the uh, cases of people building retirement portfolios in their thirties, um, through a combination of, you know, just passive investing, things like that. There's a lot of elements that go into play, you know, being in the right place in the right time, you know, going through a, a bull market for 10 years and being all in on investing will get you pretty good close to having that ability to achieve financial, uh, independence. But it's not for everybody. Not everybody can do that. Nobody's just built up with that competency level and that education level and that engagement level and that discipline level to achieve those things. So I just take what I want you to just take away from here is just when you see these kinds of uh, cases, just take it for a grain of salt. Now, am I saying that what they did to achieve their, their financial goals are wrong or incorrect? Absolutely not. Because I think there are things we can take away from their stories. And I, you know, as much, and I don't want to disparage that the people could not achieve that they've achieved some financial goals in their life and they should be credited. But there's a point where we just can't assume that it will work for them. So it's going to work for me. Like, for example, like, uh, like I'm reading this article here called, can you really retire in your thirties? And it talks about some of the ingredients that you need to kind of reach that goal. If you wanted to retire in your earlies and it talks about, you know, having an above average salary again, like, well, just go out and make more money. Well, yeah, you can do that. Again, it's about discipline, drive, ambition, and to assume everybody is at that same level to just go out and make more money is hard, but it's a key factor. Yeah, you, if you have more money coming in, then yeah, you have more opportunities to save, more opportunities to pay debt. Take it for that level. You know, they talk about living expenses, keep it living below your means. Yeah, that's a basic first tenet of, of personal finance is just don't try to spend more than what you have. So do the best you can doesn't mean you have to like rock, rock your costs down to like nothing and go home and live with your parents. Like live your life, live, there's things that we want, these things that we like that give us joy and satisfaction. Why penalize yourself to just to meet some extreme goal? Um, and here it even talks about it here, kids, it's not unusual for 30 something retirees to be kid free. That's to say some don't have kids or aren't planning on it, just some plan for children after they hit their goal or not at all. Absolutely valid. So if, if you have that plan that you're gonna have kids later in your life, 
you know, hit the retirement goal, hit, become financially independent, then have kids, that's fine. But then depending where you are, you may be in a position later in life where you just can't have kids. <laughs> just nature will say, sorry, your clock is up. That's a tough, that's a tough juggle. That's a tough emotional kind of discussion to have um, when you're face when you're looking at this kind of, when you're looking at this kind of stuff. So take away, I'm not saying ignore these case studies, take it away, listen, there's nuggets of wisdom in there, but don't just say, well, my God, these guys paid their mortgage in three years, I'm gonna do that. Because your life is different from what their life is. And your circumstances and your challenges and your constraints are different from there. Take the nuggets, take some of their strategies in terms of how to save money, take some of the strategies that they used to, but I wouldn't just adopt cold turkey, I'm gonna go cold turkey on not spending money for the next two years. That's hard. Take some of the nuggets of information that they have and apply it and try it, practice it, engage with it. If anything, engage in the process that, the, that these things that you're reading about, but tailor it to what your life is because you just, you, it's gonna set you up for, for disappointment. And so I see a lot of these articles now and to me it's porn, it's first little finance porn. It's really easy, we, you know, we kind of want, don't wanna take our eyes off and we go, hey, what's going on? Let's see what's happening here, you know? And it's, it's, a, it's a victimless crime kind of thing. And, uh, and we then look at it and go, oh my God, why am I not feeling, why am I not doing any of this stuff? And that feelings of inadequacy and having bad personal finance, personal finance image slash body image, kind of those kind of um, feelings kind of, and then what it leads us to is leading us to making uh, investment decisions, uh, savings decisions, uh, debt management decisions that are not compatible with who we are and what we're about and what our value system is and what are, what's important in our life. So take that, these types of examples with a, with a grain of salt. So that's all I wanted to talk with you about. It's something I'm just seeing, we're seeing more, you're gonna see a lot more of this stuff because again, it's sexy and media, the media loves these type of stories. They want, love putting these kind of stories out, these personal finance makeover kind of things, these examples, these case studies of how people have started from here and got to like way up here and like, zero to 60 in like three seconds, you're gonna see a lot more of these. And so one of the things you need to do is just filter it out. Under take, take the nuggets of information that you think you can bring into your own circumstance, but I would not dictate these things to be blueprints that you need to be doing or else your life has no meaning kind of thing. Far from it. So something I wanted to share with you. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, my webinar, I was, for those of you who listened to my podcast before, I was originally scheduled to do my webinar on uh, ETFs, how to invest in ETFs, um, or demystifying ETFs. That's what my that's my course is how to invest in ETFs. But the webinar I'm delivering is called demystifying ETFs. Uh, it was originally scheduled for uh, May 25th. And uh, unfortunately, there's a, a few personal uh, family issues, uh, things that have come up that have uh, required me to kind of rejig my schedule a bit. So unfortunately, I've had to delay. Uh, I'm going to be delaying that webinar for another week. So it'll actually be the following week. Uh, so I'm going to have more stuff uh, on the website. If you go to my website, sageinvestors.ca, I'm going to have a confirmed date of the, of the actual date. Uh, the new date for the webinar. So for those of you who have registered for it, I'm gonna, I've, if, I've, if you haven't already got one from me, you've already gotten a, an email from me telling you that I've had to change the date. And uh, if you're still interested in, uh, in, in attending, please let me know so I can just make sure you're on the list so I can send you all the login coordinates for it. And uh, so just that's one announcement. And speaking of the webinar, so the webinar I'm doing is about demystifying ETFs. We kind of, you know, ETFs are really becoming the thing right now. Everybody's talking about it. There's, we're seeing this generational transfer from traditional mutual funds, just investing in individual stocks into ETF products. So a lot of people are going, what the hell? What the hell are ETFs about? Why do I need to care about them? What's so good about them? What's not so good about them? Because um, there are drawbacks to them. And so in this webinar, this one hour webinar I'm gonna be doing, I'm gonna be sharing with you um, some of my thoughts and some of the things that you need to have a way better understanding of what these things are. And what, I, what, what I'm really excited about is I'm actually gonna do a case study. I'm gonna share with you a situation where I went about and deciding to buy an ETF for my portfolio. And I'm gonna share with you how I went through about analyzing these things to figure out if it's a good ETF or not a good ETF 
to include in my portfolio. So I'm gonna share with you my little case study with it on top of that. So I'm really looking forward to that because I don't think a lot of people do this kind of stuff. People just put the bullet points of what they are and what they are. It's one thing to say something, it's another thing to practice trying to using these things or figuring out which one things you want to include in your portfolio. So look out for that. You can go to my website, sageinvestors.ca, and uh, for registration information on that. So that's pretty much all I got for you this week. Uh, if you got any questions about this topic of personal finance porn or anything else you want me to ask, answer uh, about investing, hit me through my website, sageinvestors.ca, or you can uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm on there all the time commenting about my own decisions. I tweet my, my own investing decisions in real time and also my general observations and what I'm actually consuming and reading uh, in terms of information that I'm using to make my own personal investment decisions. You can follow me, my uh, tag is at Sage Investors. So you can DM me if you have a question about that, you have a question about my coaching services, uh, my online courses um, that I offer. Love to hear from you, it's all good. So that's another episode of Stock Talk. Uh, my name is Amon Reina of Sage Investors and thanks for, thanks for listening in, thanks for watching and we'll catch you again another time. Take care, bye. Oh, 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 oh,